Mr. Hannah very much, very kind of you to introduce me. I'm very honored, actually, to be asked to give a talk about uh, Freddie Tate at St. Andrews. He's really one of the most famous sons, I think, family having lived in St. Andrews quite a time. Uh, I'm a retired Blackwatch officer. I live at Merthley, just north of Perth. And I've been jolly lucky to be a member of the RA for 42 years. But all my life, I've tried, without success, to emulate prowess of the late <laughs> Lieutenant F.G. Tate of the regiment. Um, let's go. We're also so lucky in the RA to have this wonderful picture. Uh, we've got very famous officers in the Black Watch, perhaps predominantly Field Marshal Earl Wavell. But um, I have to tell you that Lieutenant Freddie Tate has brought great honor and fame to the regiment as well. So I want to give you an account of his the amateur golfing and also tell you a bit about his Black Watch time and also, as you know, he was killed in the Boer War. Aged only 30 on the 7th of February, 1900. Um, I'm very grateful for quite a bit of help I've had from Laurie Ray, the museum here, and from Hannah. And I've obviously borrowed a lot from the golfing biography by John F. Lowe, which is called F.G. Tate being his life and letters and golfing diary. And if you can get hold of that letter, or that book rather, John F. Lowe's book, I would recommend it. Sometimes it comes up in the, uh, on Amazon, etc. I've also read Robin Welsh's excellent article on him, and I've learned a lot from a chap called Steve Lunderstedt, who was the secretary of the Kimberley Golf Club in South Africa. And of course, we've got military details of him in the Blackwatch Museum in Perth. Now, I hope there are no copyright laws that I've broken. <laughs> Talking about somebody 120 years ago, more or less, you've really got to read up from other people's books, pinching photographs and uh, quotes. Otherwise, you really can't start. In uh, the year 2000, I did lead a party of the Black Watch, four golfers and four from the Highland Brigade, who were also out in the Boer War at the time, to South Africa, to Kimberley, and we were able to take part in a ceremony at his grave in Kimberley exactly a hundred years after he died. And Willie Tate, who some of you may know here, um, he came out with us with his two other brothers. They were great nephews. And uh, we had a wonderful week out in Kimberley. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So they were all great nephews. And there are still one or two members of the Tate family, members of the RNA, now. Um, so I'm a bit worried about the fact that maybe one or two great experts here, if you are an expert, don't ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to tell you, as you said, Hannah, that my grandfather Sydney Innes was a fellow subaltern in the 2nd Battalion of Black Watch, and he was also wounded at Magus Fontaine. And they did play some golf together before the World War, but I'm afraid my grandfather was not such a fine player as Freddie Tate. So, as I say, we've got the wonderful portrait here of Freddie Tate by John Henry Lorimer, which hangs in our big room. Now, I wonder if I could just try and point out a few little details if you can see them, because they're quite interesting. His caddy was apparently slightly blind, and he very often chose this boy because he liked him and he seemed to do a good job. But, I mean, he was looking at it, he looks as though all the clubs were about to fall out of his back. <laughs> and uh, his, his little dog, Nails, is also there, and we come to Nails later on. You see his plus four suit, uh, which was all very smart, but they wore those at that time, because none of the wonderful golfing equipment, waterproof golfing equipment, had not really come into play at that stage. And Freddie, like me, is smartly dressed with his regimental tie. I've got a regimental belt on as well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got regimental socks, stockings, regimental band at the bottom. 
who had read the book uh, brief. Um, you can see the Holy Trinity Church, Tom Kirk behind in the picture, and you can also see that he's only got nine clubs. Now, nowadays a good golfer with a caddy would be off with a huge bag, you know, with 14 clubs in the set, uh, three driver, three wood, five wood, a rescue club, a pitching wedge, and seven irons, and a putter. Um, but uh, they also had all their wet weather kit there as well. In those days, you set off, and that's all you had. <coughs> and so a tweed suit was probably the best thing. Um, he is shown uh, in some of the pictures with a clique, which I think I can quickly describe as a putter with a slight lo loft on it. And he putted with that most of the time, and not a straight putter like you and I use these days. So now, he was the son of a very interesting man, the Edinburgh physicist, Peter Guthrie Tate, pioneer of thermodynamics, professor of natural philosophy at Edinburgh University. And he too was an enthusiastic golfer. He had seven children, one of whom, the eldest son, John, was also a very good golfer, John Guthrie Tate. He was runner-up in the amateur championship in 1887. He was also a Scottish rugger international player. So our hero, really, was born in Edinburgh. So 148 years ago. And he was to become the most famous amateur golfer of his time. And I'd like to show you a little bit more about his early life. While they were living in Edinburgh, they spent most of their summer holidays in St Andrews. And it was here that the professor's youngest son, Freddie, coached by his father and his elder brother, became such an accomplished golfer. Started playing golf age five. And he learned to play the old course, sometimes playing several rounds a day. He started to record all his scores from the age of 14. And there were children's golf matches at that time, organized by the famous greenkeeper, Tom Morris. That's his brother, and that's my right. And there's Tom Morris. His initial education was at the Edinburgh Academy. And then he went on to Sidborough College Sedbra School in the Yorkshire Dales. He played every sort of sport at Sedbra and some golf at the local Sedbra Golf Club. And while he was there, he apparently saved the life of a boy called Craggs, who disappeared in a whirlpool in a local river. So straight away, his housemaster wrote a report saying he's a thoroughly jolly boy, any amount of backbone developing in himself. And here is a portrait by the great Thomas Hodge, with his wonderful portraits of St. Andrew's golfers, called the diver. And you can see he's developing well. <laughs> About this time, Freddie drove a ball for miles. And it passed through the hat of a player playing well in front of him. <laughs> this cost him five shillings and an apology. And he told old Tom Morris about the incident. He said, Ah, oh, Master Freddy, you must be very thankful it's only a hat and no an oak coffin you have to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> he failed his first attempt to get into Sandhurst. He was advised to try again. He went to the University of Edinburgh and he studied mathematics, English, and Latin, which you had to do in those days, to get into the army. And he passed into the Royal Military College, Sandhurst. But while he was at the university, he was in the Queen's University Volunteers, the University Golf Club, played for the Edinburgh Ackies, and cricket for the Grange. I wonder whether he got the work done. <laughs> no, I really must not joke about the work he did because he actually passed in fifth to Sandhurst, which is tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, achievement. 
And so that idea is a picture of an RMC, Royal Military College, today. He was apparently encouraging all the people at Sandhurst to take up golf, and uh, he excelled at cricket and rugby and shooting whilst he was there. And he was made a cadet corporal, which was one of the sort of honours who got. He might have been an under officer, but he was a cadet corporal, which was on the way up. So I'm going to give you this picture just at the moment while I go on talking. He applied for foreign service, which I suppose everybody would like to do when they first joined. And he was disappointed because he was commissioned into the second battalion of the Leinster Regiment. I didn't even know much about the Leinsters, but they were an Irish regiment, of course, 109th of foot. And they were quartered at Shorncliffe in Kent. Now, <laughs> while he was there, he broke the course record at Deal and at Folkestone. And then they moved to Aldershot. Why did he go to an Irish regiment? I can only speculate that the Leinsters were short of officers and that the powers that be thought he ought to go there. He had no particular claim at that time for the Black Watch. <coughs> and they might have also said that uh, as he was stationed in Folkestone, he might be able to play a lot of golf for Royal St. George's. And I dare say that might have carried things. He liked the Leicester Regiment, and he um, carried the Queen's colour in front of Queen Victoria at Aldershot at a review. He played the Aldershot course and wrote to his mother saying that it was awfully bad. And I think that was because that particular area is very muddy. And I think in the winter it was probably unplayable, certainly compared to St. Andrew's Stone. So in 1890, when he was 20, he joined the RNA. And he had three months before going to the Leinsters, and he entered for the first time the Calcutta Cup, Jubilee Vars, and the Autumn Meeting here. In the Calcutta Cup, for the first time, he had a 77, which is pretty good. But later on, he was to record the record round of 72 on the Open. In uh, 1899, a little later on, Age still very young, he was asked to attend a meeting of the RNA's Rules Committee. I mean, it was full of very experienced and learned golfers. And they wanted somebody as good as him to sort of give them the modern point of view. It was very interesting. And some will know that the RNA revised the rules just recently. And it's just a matter for the United States Golfing Association to agree them, and then we'll all have a new set. So, as I say, we've still got some Tate members in the, in the army. On the 11th of January, 1893, he made his famous record drive with the gutty golf ball. 341 yards, apparently, with a carry of 250 yards. And that was on the 13th at St. Andrews, the old course. And he was playing behind his brother, Willie and his partner, and you hit the ball right over their heads. <laughs> and it landed 10 yards short of Walking Shaw's grave bunker, I'm told. It was a very cold morning, and indeed the fairway was frozen, which maybe meant that the ball bounced along rather further than a normal shot would do on a nice normal day. So great was the drive that all his partners and players in front measured it. And Freddie wrote down, no doubt you will say, as the governor, called his father the governor, as the governor will say, stuff, humbug. But the fact still remains, it was an extremely long drive. And his father, a professor of physics, you see, he'd written a learned article in Golf Magazine, proving conclusively that it's impossible to carry a, a gutty ball more than 190 yards, unless you exerted three times more energy. <laughs> but later on, the professor and Freddie went on testing the hitting the golf ball, and they wanted to find out the initial speed of a ball after a good drive. And they came up with a statistic of 220 feet per second. I'm sure you all know. <laughs> 
When he found that two of his brother officers were leaving the Leinsters, and he also found that his platoon was being drafted abroad, he applied to join a Highland regiment. And that's when he joined the Black Watch, 1894, when he was 24. And he joined the second battalion of the Black Watch, stationed at Barry Camp, Camp of Bonifice, what's now the area of Barry Button Training Camp. Uh, the transfer meant that he forfeit some leave. But as he said, in any case, leave is of small consequence when you have the honour of belonging to the 73rd. He's very proud to be in the Black Rock. But now, of course, he had the opportunity to play the Pan Muir course, Carnoustie course, and to come here and play and enter the competitions. He's posted nearby. But you might like to know too, he was a very keen shot with the shotgun. Uh, he enjoyed curling and wild fowling on the Eden River history. Now, what was this young officer really like? He was 5 foot 11 tall, and he weighed about 12 stone 4. He kept himself extremely fit, playing all the sports available hockey, cricket, and particularly golf. He was an extremely popular officer, and he was very much loved by his men, we were told. And um, he was very well known in St. Andrews. The locals could only complain one thing, and that was his playing the pibroch on his bagpipes in the evening. <laughs> in the foreword to his book, F.G. Take the Record, by John Lowe, Andrew Lang wrote, he brought sunshine wherever he came. He went in there to look at his kind, strong, friendly face and honest eyes. He was full of goodwill. He was a young man, a soldier, an athlete. So good, so jolly, so devoid of conceit, despite his immense popularity on the links. Andrew Lang went on to describe, it's not a very good photograph, which I'll put it, Freddie Tate playing at St. Andrews. And he said at first it was his extraordinary driving, which was his chief attraction, but later he aimed for more accuracy and he drove within his powers. And like many players in those days, he smoked a pipe while playing his round of golf, laying his briar pipe on the grass when he was making a stroke. Uh, Andrew Lang went on, um, his resource was wonderful. I remember his making a beautiful approach with one foot in and the other foot out of a steep bunker with the ball trembling on a blade of grass in the sand on the brink. He said, the best round I ever saw him do was a 72, the record then being 73. He was playing, I think, with old Tom Morris and Mr. Hull. When he held out, he said, that putt took a year off my life. So great was the nervous tension. <laughs> well, I suppose we all know about these putts on the final hole. <laughs> John Lowe wrote, his game displayed absolute grace of movement, a complete evenness of style. He preferred the foursome game above all, Writing to his brother in 1898, he said, I can't say I care much for the score game. I prefer the cut and thrust of a match to medal play. And, and a congenial foursome, the greatest engagement of all. Well, those of us in the definitely agree with that, I think. <laughs> Although we have to play a few medals. <laughs> he never married, which is obviously sad. But I think he was so busy with his military career and his amazing successes in golf. Now, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to go into every detail of all the 28 tournaments that he won, except to say that he did win 28 major tournaments, many of them on the old course and also at Royal St. George's. He entered the Open Championship nine times, and he came third on three of those occasions. He was playing against those amazing professionals. His 
this picture again in the RNA on the staircase. As you know, James Bray, John Henry Taylor, and Harry Varden. And he was playing against these professionals as an amateur. You know, it's amazing how well he kept up. There is only one thing to say, of course, that the Americans had not joined the Open Championship of the United States, so maybe the competition wasn't quite so intense as it is now, and foreign players <coughs> as well. And of course, I must mention our past captain of the RNA, Michael Bernalek, who won the amateur five times. Um, Johnny Ball, before that, who won it eight times. It was extraordinary how successful these people were, consistently successful. I'd like to make another point. Um, in Freddie Tate's era, the course, like the old course, were really quite rough and ready compared to today's high greenkeeping standards. Some of the courses have their fairways brushed or mowed every day, and the greens are similarly treated. And at St Andrews, too, you all know the changes that have been made on the old course and the other courses. Gorse bushes have been removed for faster play, and thousands of players who want to play the old course. And it was amazing that these past golfing experts were able to record such high scores, and also with that gutty ball. Freddie had this one dog. Oh, there's a gutty There goes nails. He required this dog uh, while well, he was at the in Aldershot in 1895, and he had it for six years. And you told me, you told me this evening, it may well be true that he died the same year as, as Freddie did. I hadn't heard that before, but it seems to be a very, very likely story. Um, John Lowe, again his biographer, wrote, he was a good and true dog but a deadly enemy to all the rest of the animal world, <laughs> not accepting his own drugs from the canine race. He was apparently a Bedlington Terrier, who at one time was banned from St Andrews for fighting with another dog within the town. <laughs> Freddie's greatest achievement was the two amateur championships he won. He had actually reached the semi final in 1893, 1894, and 1895. But his first victory came in 1896. And he beat Harold Hilton, frankly well known amateur of those days. Eight and seven. I mean, what a tanky. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the Royal St. George's final. And in that championship, Pete had to beat those amateurs, John Laidley, Johnny Ball, Horace Hutchison, and then had to face Harold Hilton in the final. In 1896, he was chosen by the Black Watch to do the Royal Guard at uh, Royal Guard at Balmoral. And he took his bagpipes up. Now, he had a limited piping vocabulary, but he concentrated on playing seven tunes very well. Now, I don't know how many of you fingers play the pipes, but it was the Glen of Rural Highlanders, 79th Farewell to Gibraltar, the Port Tree Men, Pibroch of Donald Dew, Jenny's Ball B, Breaking Castle, and the Earl of Mansfield. He was good at those. <laughs> and here he was on full ceremonial uniform, just like your print. And um, he met the Tsar of Russia, who was staying with Queen Victoria, I think, at Balmora at the time, who asked him about golf. And Freddie apparently said, I took it seriously when I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> he very much enjoyed the shooting the fishing at Balmoral, and there's a record that he caught five salmon on the D, with the largest being 22 pounds. Amazing chap. He was then given a wonderful staff appointment as a captain in the Inspector of Gymnasia, 
and he went around the country inspecting gymnasiums at all the big army units. Later he was posted up to Scotland to do the same job. He inspected gymnasia in the barracks in Scotland. He found plenty of time to play golf, and I think he was undoubtedly given leave to play golf for the honour of the Black Watch, I'm sure he was. And he kept a diary all through this period. Now, Mr. Lowe's book's got 10, 15 pages of this diary, which is very interesting to see how accurate and clever he was to keep the thing going. Some of his bigger matches are there as well. You can see the detail that he kept. In 1898, he won his second album. And this time, he beat Samuel Muir Ferguson by seven and five. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a two and one or anything like that. He sloshed these people. <laughs> and um, apparently, there were a few people watching, and he missed an easy putt at the end. And uh, he endeared himself to the people, saying, oh, thank you very much to, for the, receiving my fluky win. I ought to have been beaten twice today, but I got off. I played a bit better today, but I don't really deserve the championship. You know, he's wonderfully self effacing In 1899, a year before he died, he lost the final at Preston to Johnny Ball. And here, the lovely is not a very really good friend of a man in the water. But the 37th hole, Freddie Tate's drive failed to carry the sand hills, and he ended up in what they call the Alps, which was a large cross bunker short of the green full of water. However, Tate waded in and he managed to hit the floating gutter percha ball out of the water and he managed to half the hole. And he did at one time own an amazing club which had a hole in the blade, really just for that eventuality. And we've got one or two in the club actually here, yeah, it's extraordinary. I don't know if it's Freddy's clubs, but they did have this blade full of Holes, slotted holes to take the water. I'd like to just emphasise his great friendship with old Tom Morris. These pictures came from Golf Golf Illustrated, I think. And this one of the old boy himself, I think after he retired. In 1898, two years before he died, he made a bet he said, I can play from Royal St. George's Golf Club in Sandwich to the neighbouring Royal St. Port Golf Club, 3.2 miles away. And they said, uh, well, sure, sure. So he had a competition with a friend of his. And there was much scrub to be overcome between these two courses. But um, he had a bit of a gallery of friends who came out to watch. And he had nails, of course, who might have been help in finding the old ball. <laughs> uh, and he achieves the thing in 32 strokes. But unfortunately, the final shot went through the clubhouse window, mm. and uh, much of his winnings were paid in compensation. <laughs> <laughs> he was asked to play in many courses. And um, that's the one that's got the cleat in his hand, by the way. We think he's got a cleat. Not terribly clear, I'm afraid, but actually there's a slight loft on the board right there. All rarely missing anything under six foot. Some other photos of him. This is another of a hodge picture. How to get out of the filthy lab. Again, very stylish, I think, at the end of his swing. Finish for now. I'm not sure if we played like that. We would all be very good off the school. He played against the well known golf professional Ben Sayers at the newly lengthened course at North Berry. And afterwards, Ben Sayers says, Beat it! by eight holes on my own green. 
It's not possible, <laughs> but it's a fact. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I take all these quotes from the book, so I don't think I have these books. Later, Bernard Darwin, the great golf correspondent, said he was the greatest amateur never to have won the Open at his time. And there were more photographs of him in action. But this is the last one taken of him at St. Andrews, just before the medal in 1900. Now, if you're still with me, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to come to this bit about the last few months of Freddie State's life in the army. The second Boer War broke out in October 1899, and he was still a lieutenant of the second town of the Black Watch, and sent out to Cape Town in South Africa to fight. And the battalion was sent up to the front line to the relief of Kimberley. Remember, Kimberley was secured by the Boers, and it had all those gold mines, diamond mines, and we just had to get and he took part in the Battle of Magusfontein in the 11th of December, 1899, where he was wounded in the thigh. He wrote a letter to his mother giving his account of the slaughter of the 2nd Battalion as they made their approach. Light began to fade the previous evening. They were being led, the Boers, by Combat General de la Rey, who was a formidable fighter. Everyone thought, the military intelligence said, that the Boers were holding the top of the hill. And you might think that that's a sensible thing to do, strategically, to hold the hills. But they were not. They realized they had such an enormous number of British troops in front of them, they actually came down off the top of the hill and were out at the bottom. Freddie recounted that General Andy Walker of the Black Watch who was the Highland Brigade commander, commanded the battalion and took them into a position the night before in a thunderous rainstorm. And a dawn attack was planned the next morning. But the Boers, as I say, had moved downhill. The general led the Highland Brigade with his claymore. He didn't have a rifle or pistol or anything else. He gallantly went forward with, with the claymore. He was killed almost immediately. And his body was found only 250 yards away from the enemy. And within minutes, Lieutenant Colonel John Code, who was commanding our battalion, was also killed. And minutes after that, the adjutant, Captain McFarlane, was also killed. And you could see the command and control of that battalion would have been chattered for a bit until everybody could think again and work out what to do. The jocks found themselves soaked to the skin. They came up against barbed wire. This was the first time in battle that they had done that. And of course, they didn't know what it was like. And it got caught in their kilts and caused complete shambles. I think there was a shambles at Magus Fontaine. There was no doubt about it. They were thoroughly surprised. But Freddie Tate wrote about this. And he said, General Walker was in no way responsible for the fearful loss of life among the Highland Brigade. He got his orders and he had to carry them out. And he was killed in front of his brigade. And this is the important thing. He said, I feel certain that had we been led up to the line, we should have rushed the Boer position to probably a quarter of the loss that we did actually suffer. As it was, we arrived rather late in a mass of quarter column. Now that means people in three ranks, okay? Advancing forward in three ranks. Now, that's a tremendous target for machine guns or other rifle fire. And so he said, if only we were led up in line, if we'd gone forward in line, we'd never have had the same number of casualties. You can imagine the very hot rifle fire in that compact body of men. And he thought that the jocks behaved extremely well in spite of all that. But Freddie was wounded, and he had to lie out on the ground with a number of other wounded all the next day, because they were under sniper fire, and any medical help 
couldn't get through to him. Their water, their water bottles dried up, and some men lost their lives during that period because they moved and they were sniped at. And some had terrible injuries to the back of their legs as a penalty of wearing the kilt. There was no way of them sort of stopping the sun burning. Freddy Diary says he nevertheless managed to smoke a few cigarettes while keeping his head down at the same time. And in all, the Black Watch lost 303 officers and other ranks who were either killed, wounded, or missing in this battle. It was one of our real major engagements. <coughs> but again, in his diary, he says he noted that McGregor, the caddy master of St. Andrews, who again had joined the Black Watch, he was also killed that day. Now, there was an inquiry about Magnus Fontaine, and Freddie Tate's account was very important. Because whilst he was at Sandhurst, he did field drawing. For instance, he could picture a castle ahead of him, a hill ahead of him, a valley ahead of him, a glen, and he could sketch it accurately. And his sketches were used in this uh, court of inquiry. And here we have the man, I'm afraid, who was commanding. Major General Lord Methuen of the Scots Guards, and he was severely censured for not uh, doing a proper reconnaissance of that battle. He fired his artillery on top of the hill, which had no effect whatsoever, because all the Boers were down at the bottom in trenches. We had a black watch chap who wrote a poem. I wonder whether you can pick it. I'll read it for you. Robert Smith in the second town. He said, such was the day for our regiment, dread the revenge we will take. Dearly we paid for the blunder of drawing room general's mistake. Why weren't we told of the trenches? Why weren't we told of the war? Why were we marching in column? Made Tommy, Tommy Atkins in the choir. This is a very quick poem which sums up Magus Fontaine quite well. Our Field Marshal Lord Wavell actually paid a visit to Magnus Fontaine and wrote an article for our regimental magazine much, much later on. And he said, Magnus Fontaine was an isolated hill rising out of the plain on the way to Kimberley. The British Army could have turned around it, but that was not the fashion then. They had to attack it. Now, the wounded Freddy Tate was sent back to Cape Town and the military hospital at Weinberg. And whilst he was recovering, he went aboard HMS Niobe, which was a ship in harbor for a short trip. And that's the last photograph we've got of him. And my grandfather, Sidney Ellis, was also wounded, and they were together at Weinberg Hospital. What we do know is that they both dined at the Mount Nelson Hotel when they were slightly more walking wounded. And some of you who have been to Cape Town might well have been there, the expensive hotel, but rather a lovely position. And later, he and my grandfather shared a tent when he went back to Modda River where he rejoined his battalion. I don't think he ever played golf in South Africa at that time because, of course, he was injured. There was an amusing letter he got from one of his friends and the Gordon Highlanders who were also out there. This was Lachlan Wolf Murray of the second battalion of the Gordons. They played some golf together in Scotland and hearing his friend had been shot in the thigh and hadn't been killed, Wolf Murray wrote saying, it was very lucky that bullet had a slice on it. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful picture which we know. I come to the last part, the tragic death of Freddie Tate. Again, only second. He returned to Modder River and he found that his company commander was ill and had been told to rest. He became the company commander as a lieutenant. There was usually a captain in between and then the major. And he became the company commander. And soon after that he was given the task to clear a small hill which dominated the road to Kimberley, which was called Kudu's Drift. I shall be brief. 
H Company, which he commanded, secured the top of the hill, and they decided, or freely say, decided they could have their lunch. And I think they slightly relaxed, and there was a sniper. One poor sniper left over, and he pinned down pretty thing. He said, I'm afraid I'm badly hit. They've got me this time. And he fell and dropped to the ground dead. The sniper, as you might imagine, was quickly killed, and the men carried their company commander down the slope and buried him beside the right river, near, uh, near, near Model River, and later he was moved to Kimberley. Just want to say a quick word about the Boers. They were mainly countrymen, but they were all armed with a modern German repeater rifle, almost rather more efficient than our own rifle. They were marksmen, trained from childhood, rather like a gamekeeper, I think, because they could take advantage of cover and terrain. They could pulverize any close quarter formation, like three ranks of soldiers. They probably lacked individual discipline, and they had little training in tactics, yet their ability to cut and run after they just opposed us was legendary and very effective. Well, in the year 2000, 18 years ago, I went out to a wonderful ceremony, a whole week of golf at Kimberley, organized by the Kimberley Golf Club. I led a party of four Black Watch, four from the Highland Brigade, that's the Gordons and the Cameron Highlands were also out right there, to the Kimberley Golf Club for five days of golf. Willie Tate and his two brothers, who were great nephews of Frank Tate, came out. And the RNA produced a team, Scots Guards and Loughless U produced a club, a team. Very nice lads, I remember. And ten South African teams, including the South African police, took part. Bloody annoying because the South African police won it. <laughs> <laughs> On the first practice day, Willie Tate, talking about that, he hasn't been able to come to that. Um, he had a hole in one. Mm. Now this absolutely helped our whole week. With, uh, he gave us a pretty taste down there for you. Um, you know, doing a hole in one, he was almost as good as his ancestor. So that made a lot of splash in the, in the papers. Now we were able to attend a service around his grave exactly on the same date, 7th of February, 100 years after he was killed. It is an extraordinary thing. He was probably the most well-known popular British person in the Anglo-Boer War. You would think it was generals and other officers with titles, like Lord Methuen. Not lowly lieutenants. But the Boers knew all about Freddie Day, amateur golfer. Now, because golf was in its infancy out right there in South Africa. And the leading amateurs and professionals had received much media attention out in South Africa. And they knew all about Prince Tate. And they knew he was likely to be fighting against them. And they were, some of them were extremely sad that they picked him. There was quite a lot of sorrow that they got him. They didn't mind the other British people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether you know that the leading South African amateur golfer wins the uh, Freddie Tate Cup in the South African Open Championship. This was donated by a British touring team to the South African Golf Association. It is still played for. And people like Bobby Locke and Ernie Ells have all won that cup. It's extraordinary the connection the regiment has with golfing and South Africa. And this year it was run by this guy called Cameron Morley. Freddie Tate wrote to his brother about events in South Africa and he said, Look, in the event of my death, leave my putter to the nearest golf club to where I might be killed if I am killed. And after a few years, the well known professional J.H. Taylor went out and presented Kimberley Golf Club with the putter. And I have to tell you that the Freddie Tate putter competition is the senior, most important cup at Kimberley, to this day. 
And they also have a fine museum of Freddie Tate memorabilia. Now, Loch Ness and our three visitors tonight, it's very nice of you to come. I'm so, so grateful about that. They have a whole host of Freddie Tate's medals. I don't think they're displayed like this. I've seen them displayed in your dining room. They're beautifully displayed. And there are lots of other Freddie Tate things, which I'm sure you'll be able to visit at Loch Ness View. So we come now to the Henry Tate, as well the Lorimer painting again. So um, there's a lot in St Andrews about Freddie Tate. So there's the St Andrews Hospital Ward, you may know, and uh, that is the black, it is up there. The 16th hole on the Jubilee is named after him. You've got a Freddie Tate Street in the town. There's a memorial tablet in St. John's Episcopal Church in Edinburgh, because when they were in Edinburgh, that's where they worshipped. That's near the Caledonian Hotel, in the source. And in any history of the game of golf and the amateur golf championship, you'll find Freddie Tate's come, you know, coming up <coughs> in 18, 1890 to 1900, 10-year period. Many will know the Black Watch South African War Memorial on the mound as you climb up towards the castle of the Edinburgh. Lovely Black Watch Monument. Again, Tate's name is on that. And here, finally, um, is his grave in South Africa, in Kimberley. In St Andrews too, we've got the Pretty Tate belt, the medal awarded to the winner of the St Andrews Links trophy. And that's what he looks like. It's a backwards badge on the belt. And that's a box it comes in with the winner's more inscribed and the citation of five his juice. It was presented by all the golf clubs in St Andrews on hearing of Freddie's death. And last year, our Black Watch people had that. Sorry, sorry the, the, the last widow was, was this other chap, uh, Matthew Jordan, who was a local, isn't he? I think he comes from somewhere in Scotland. Pretty sure. So let's go to the code again. He was our Richmond Christmas card last year. So to summarize, he was a genuine national hero and a national name. Bernard Darwin again said, I don't think I've ever seen any other golfer adored by the crowds. No, not Harry Varden or Bobby Jones in their primes. He was clearly a superb golfer and a fan's favorite. And John Lowe again, he played the game like a Scottish gentleman, with dignity and strictness, tempered with unfailing courtesy. And as somebody said to me this evening, one could only imagine what might have been, been, been able to achieve had he been able to live beyond the age of 30. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was my tribute to the great amateur golfer and well-known Blackwatch Centre. Thank you very much.